Christ, my brethren, we shall continue in our lesson from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, the second, chapter 8. The second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded and the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were, f were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. <clears throat> and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, See that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is a first, there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, and their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, He who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all of the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself, and to show your ready mind, avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of God, of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many, many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore show to them the be and before the churches the proof of your love and your boasting on your behalf. Amen. The hour has come now. The Apostle Paul is in the church of the Corinthians. And he is referring to a special requirement and matter which is for you to offer. From the abundance that you have with joy. To him who is in want. And the Apostle Paul brings as an exam example the churches of Macedonia by saying, We make known to you, my brethren, the grace of God that is given 
to the churches of Macedonia. He interprets, he explains that for man to be able to offer, this is the grace of God. On his own, he cannot. If, in other words, God doesn't give him grace, the offering will be small, but especially without joy. Because the offering that God wants is for it to be given with joy, so that he who offers may enjoy the love of God, because it is written, this promise of God, that says, God loves a cheerful giver. <clears throat> the first promise. The second promise is that he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows abundantly will reap abundantly. So it is a special grace that God gives to the hearts of men, so that just as the churches of Macedonia their joy may abound in offering while they are passing through a great trial of affliction and deep poverty so that they abounded in this way the riches of their liberality, of their simplicity. So the Apostle Paul reveals the Word of God to us today, the Apostle Paul to the Church of the Corinthians back then, that man, any person, no matter how good a Christian he may be, he cannot offer with joy from the abundance that he has so that he may enjoy the love of God but also, by sowing in abundance, he may enjoy also the abundance of God. And he cannot do this unless God gives grace. You see, my dear brethren, that everything in our life is a result of the grace of God. On the other hand, if it is done with pressure, there may be results, or even with flattering, there may be results in this offering, but it doesn't have the results of the promise of God. In other words, the Apostle Paul says that if it is for you to give, do not give unless you do this with joy, with abundance of joy, so that you may, this work that you perform may have a reward. As for example, he brought the, as example the churches of Macedonia who were going through a great tribulation and deep poverty, yet <coughs> the Apostle Paul says, I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, with their whole heart they offered, and even though they were in deep poverty, in great trial of affliction, I implored them to not, but they, with persistence and urgency, pleaded with us, they insisted that we accept the fellowship of the ministering to the saint, the saints. And indeed, not in the way that we hope for. But first they dedicated themselves to the Lord. And then to us they offered by the will of God. This is a great secret, my brethren. Even more, the Word of God assures us that he who lends, he who gives, gives to the poor, lends to the Lord. So it does not matter what you give, what you offer, in the needs of your brethren or the work of God, 
But what is important is how you offer. How is what determines the reward of God. If you offer it by force, with sorrow, out of need, so others can see you maybe. For flattering, for glory of man even. The offering is vain. In other words, the Apostle Paul says, let it not be done. Better to not be done. Because he who gives doesn't benefit. But if it is done with joy, with your own inclination, and not sparingly, but abundantly, then the results from God are sure. Man, this man on one hand will enjoy the love of God, and the love of God has protection, has defense, has care, growth, edification, assistance, help in the time of need. So he will enjoy not only the love of God, but especially he will enjoy the abundance of God in his life. This man. An abundance not in material things, but an abundance especially in spiritual things, especially in the presence of God, but also in the material things, because now this man is useful to God, and for that reason, God will give him because he trusts him that this man will give. And the person who has this grace of God, because on the other hand, as we said, <coughs> there is the pressure of men, even flattering. Or anything else, any other criteria or mean that man uses to convince others. This is not the grace of God. This is something else, something different. He doesn't have, because it isn't the grace of God, he doesn't have the favor and the result of the promise of God. But for man to be able to enjoy this grace, it is a necessary condition and it means, first of all, that he dedicate himself to Christ so that he may be able to dedicate to men from the things that he has. So the Apostle Paul says, We urge Titus, that as he had begun the good work in you Corinthians, to also complete this special grace in you. To speak to you about the grace of God, to bring you as an example the churches in Macedonia, so that God may stir up your sincere heart and understanding. So as you abound in everything, because in the beginning, when he sent the first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said that you are rich. You are rich in the word of God, in the knowledge of God, and you fall short in no gift. So as you abound in all spiritual matters, that is faith, the word of God, in knowledge of the will of God, in diligence and in working in the work of God and the will of God, in your love for us, says the Apostle Paul, now see that you abound in this grace also, the grace of offering. Because the grace of God has a reward as he finds hearts that are ready to do the will of God that is good, perfect, and pleasing. And in verse 8, he says something very serious. I speak not by commandment. I do not command you. I do not pressure you.
I do not push you for you to do something like this. But I encourage you so that I may test with the zeal and the care that you will show for this grace that the sincerity of your love may be revealed to show if your love is genuine for your brethren. And we said, my dear brothers and sisters, that the characteristic of the Christian is love which must be genuine, which must be true from the depths of his heart. And the love of the Christian in the church has levels. First, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, and power, above all. Secondly, second level, love your brother with a love that is unique, just like Christ has loved you. To love one another the way that Christ loved us. When we love God with all our heart, our mind, and our soul, and our power, then we enjoy this love of God and the, and the love of the Father. When we love our brethren as Christ has loved us, then we enjoy the grace of Christ in our life. Thirdly, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Not more. There are levels of love. <clears throat> so that the person that God brings close to us, that we may make him, that we may do to him whatever we want him to do to us. Third level, our neighbor, not the stranger, not the disrespectful, the wicked, not the enemy, not the unbeliever. And our neighbor is first are those who are of our faith, and then everyone that Christ brings in our path. As for example, the Good Samaritan, where the Bible says, by chance, the priest went by, by chance. What does this mean? By the will of God, without the, himself realizing, by chance he passed by, by chance the Levite went by, and by chance the Samaritan went by as well. <coughs> the man who was an Israelite, but he had different doctrine. And it does not matter who it is, but what matters is who became neighbor to the wounded, who was this Samaritan, but he did not become a neighbor to the wounded, not the priest nor the Levite. And fourthly, the Christian must, according to the word of God, love his enemies. In other words, he has to pray for them. Love those who hate him. And to pray for them. To love those who accuse him and swear against him. And to bless them. And to also pray for those who do harm to him. And to benedict him. Four different levels. Which determine the genuineness of our love according to the will of God. I repeat, first God, then our brethren, then those who are close to us, and then our enemies. 
very carefully so that our love does not grow short but also so that it does not surpass the limits of the Word of God. Let us not become very righteous because we will perish but also let us not be very little righteous not enough righteous because then we will not enjoy the grace of God and the mercy of God. This is the love of Christ that, cons that brings us close and the love of God that is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. For that reason, Paul insists in the Corinthians. He says, Strive to abound in the grace of offering for your Brethren in Jerusalem, strive with zeal for your brethren in Jerusalem. Because you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the grace that Christ made for us? To his brethren. <coughs> The grace that God, Christ gave to his brethren is that he was rich and he became poor so that you, his brethren, may become rich with his poverty, which is the great mystery, my brethren, of the work of Christ, of the grace of Christ. He forsook the heavenly palaces the palaces, the ivory thrones in heaven. He was a true God. He took on the form of a bondservant. He became like men. And for his brothers, for the ones that God foreknew that they would accept him, for the ones that God, because he foreknew, he predestined, for them to be in the likeness of his image, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to his Father, to the point of death, death even of the cross. For that reason, the Father gave Jesus Christ, who was the head of the church, and when he go, when Christ goes out of the church. He searches to find the lost sheep so that he may turn it back. Christ, for his body, which is the church of Christ, he became poor so that we all may become rich who accept Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the Apostle Paul continues, in this, even in this, I have advice to give you. This is to your advantage. This is something that is in your benefit, in your interest. As personality, as a existences, as a hypostasis, as a child of God, as children of God. You have begun since last year to want to participate in this offering. You began last year to do this. You made a good decision. But because the Apostle Paul knows and God knows that it is difficult, the decisions that man makes in his offering to conclude them, to finish them he makes a decision and then the uh, the thoughts begin could I should have not have done it could it be not so much not in this way and he begins to search to find the heart of man that is deceiving above all things and desperately wicked to make the decision that he's made forgive me for this in his enthusiasm or and the stirring up the Christ gave to his heart. So it is in your interest, says the Apostle Paul. As you began, and as you did, as you decided, 
with the same willingness that you may continue to want, but the most important thing, that you may finish. So this course will not lead you to diminishing, but this course will lead you to growth. This is in your benefit. With all certainty, with all diligence, keep your hearts, because you may have made the decision, but until you complete it, until you conclude it, you are in danger of falling. Because the heart of man is strong in bringing obstacles to man from doing the will of God and doing what is pleasing before God. Not only to give and to receive and the offerings, <coughs> but in every spiritual decision that man makes. Besides, let us not forget that besides our heart, there is also the world, there is also the devil, who when he sees the blessing that is coming, he strives to make it smaller, if not to stop it completely. So it is in your interest, as you started out, with the same will, even more, with the same will, that you may finish. And furthermore, be careful, not of the things that you do not have. Let not your willingness, your enthusiasm, surpass the limits that God has determined in you offering to every one of us. Do not surpass these limits because you will be found in dead ends, you will be saddened, and you will lose your reward. Without enthusiasm, but with care and with zeal, may you offer with willingness, which will be welcome and blessed by God, if you offer not from what you do not have, but from what you have. Not from the things that you do not possess, or more than the things that God has permitted you to have, but as much as a God has permitted you to have. My dear brethren, this is the grace of God. Throughout our whole life, marvelous and wondrous, but also in this special ability that the Christian has to offer with genuine love <clears throat> the grace of God is marvelous he doesn't bring man to a dead end but he gives him the chance that no matter what he wants <coughs> no matter what he can no matter what he can offer, with great promises by God, the enjoyment of the love of God the Father, and the abundance of Jesus Christ in his life. So whatever he may want, and whatever he can do, with one condition that is in his interest, that you thought, that you decided not let your heart defile it. Go on. Go further. With care, wisdom, and understanding. Not with enthusiasm or zeal. More than what you can. But neither with uh, unbelief and fear and agony. Less than what you can and are willing to do. What you can and are willing to do. And this is how the grace of God works in our life. In all things. God never says to you, do more than what you want. But in all the situations. And God never tells you, do more than what you can. 
But on the contrary, he tells us, do whatever you can. And in my eyes, God says, this, I consider it the execution. You are a doer of the word. But not only whatever you can, but also whatever you want. The absolute liberty of the grace of God in the church of Christ. But which must go on, not from it becoming smaller, but with increase. Because God will tell you, God will say, you lack one thing, you have left your first love. Do the first works, otherwise I will move your lantern. So the genuineness of love is what brings the favor of God in the life of man when he increases, when it increases and it doesn't diminish, but it increases so much so that the results of the grace of the love are achievable. Because if with zeal we act either in offering or in any other characteristic of our Christian life, more than what we want or than what we can, then the word of God comes and says, the zeal of your household has swallowed me up. You surpass the limits of your will and of your ability. But on the other hand, If this is what you want and this is what you are able to and you decide to do so, don't come with a passing of time. It is not in your interest for these to diminish because then it is the first love that becomes less and less and it will be taken away. Your lamp will be moved and your ministry will be lost. So absolute liberty and the ability of man. This is the grace of God, the wisdom of God, the genuine love of God. So if, verse 13, if you do not, if this happens, that is, if you do not mean that others should be eased by your bur but and you burdened, but by equality, there is only equality among men that only God can create in His church. Perfect equality. So that your abundance, according to your will and your ability, may cover the want of others, so that you may have in mind that the time will come when the other will have an abundance and you will be in want. It is not necessary only in material things, but in every detail of our Christian life. The other will have abundance and love. You will be in want and shortage. But now you are in abundance and he is in shortage, and love, faith, hope, the work of God, but also in material things. Because God permits everything in its time. There is a time for all things, and there is a time for everything. For that reason, God truly tests man, so that man may be found approved. We do not start by giving with enthusiasm, nor with exceedingly, exceeding zeal. But we start out and we make a decision with prayer, and of course according to the will of God. By saying that on the way I will increase it, I will never make it less. Of course, always if there is the ability and the grace of God, because... As we said, for man to offer, and I insist, not only in material things, 
The smallest part is the material things, but for man to offer with joy and great sorrow and in great poverty is the grace of God unto blessing, unto reward. Besides, remember that it is written, <coughs> whoever had gathered much manna back then, he did not receive more, and he who had little had no lack, and we will explain this, because there is a law of God that is unbreakable. The abundance of the one must cover the need of the other. But let us see how God worked back then when they didn't have food to eat and God gave manna to men in page 16 in the beginning from the book of Exodus chapter 16 and verse 15. Exodus 16, 15, 16 and 17. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was, manna. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat <coughs> and to never hunger. A law of God. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, the righteous, and his children seeking bread. Verse 16. <clears throat> this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. For one day, that is, one omer, it is about three to four liters, for each person, according to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in his tent. So how many are you in your tent? Uh, estimate one omer for each person and, uh, and gather it. Don't gather more because it will, it will just rot, uh, rot. And don't gather less because you will lack. And then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. So when they wizarded, measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over. And he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need for food. It is what the gospel of Jesus Christ says. Godliness with contentment. For you to gather more abundant riches, it'll just rot. Indeed, it says, whoever want to become rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare, and into desires that are many foolish and harmful, which... lead men to perdition and death. They are like those who gathered more manna, the Israelites, because they were afraid of their tomorrow. And the manna would rot. And what God gave them was ruined. For that reason, the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, this spiritual law of the Christian, the abundance of the one must cover the need of the other. And he continues with another very nice secret of a mind frame of God and the church. Grace be to God who gave to the heart of 
who put this earnest care for you into the heart of Titus, for not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. Now, he will, who will come to do this will of God? We don't send someone by force to do the will of God. The work of God is never done by force because then this isn't grace. But it is something else. This isn't the law of Moses, but is human oppression. We must never, and I never tell a person, do this or do that. Unless God comes and tells me. And then very carefully, and with great hesitation and much fear, I tell him, until it is proven that it was indeed by God. Everyone is governed by the Holy Spirit so that he may do the will of God. So it says, we told Titus, but what we saw is that not only was he willing, but most willing to go for this ministry, for this work. It wasn't a simple thing, this trip. For him to leave Philippi where Paul was, and Titus, and to go down to Corinth to gather whatever they had prepared so he can bring them to Jerusalem. It was affliction. It was uh, trouble. There weren't cars back then. There weren't, there weren't airplanes. They used animals. But before this marvelous work of us finding the necessary things that are abounding in the Corinthians, let us gather them and bring them to the brethren in Jerusalem who are in hunger and difficulty. But he didn't only send Titus. The Apostle Paul, in the wisdom of God, he never sent only one, either two or three or maybe more. Verse 19. And not only that, but who was also chosen with us with this gift, chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord and to show your ready mind. So we also sent a brother, and indeed, listen to this. <coughs> the, the Greek text says, anointed. Anointed by the churches. The, the anointing in the Greek ch church and the Greek language has two meanings. I stretch out my hand to vote or I stretch out my hand to anoint. And how do we understand what the meaning is? Anointed by the churches. So the churches voted how? Through the raising of the hand. Whom shall, shall we send with Titus? Who mustn't go alone. Because the Lord always sent two or three. Do you want this brother? Whom uh, they don't mention his name. And he was what voted by the churches. This brother. Why? He is praised. In the gospel. In all churches, he has a very good report from all the churches in Macedonia. Because from Macedonia, from Philippi, he writes this letter. We don't send just anyone. We send the one who has a good testimony in the church. And not only that, but also the church vote for him. I'm not the one who sends. But the church is sent. And it's not only enough for, them to be, for him to be one. But we also send someone else. Because we are afraid that someone might. Could blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us. So in the spirit. And we in the treasury of the church. There are three who oversee it. For example, it is Adonisella, it's Yorgos Katsoulas, and it is also Mikhail Papanikolaou. 
but also for the poor, there is Brother George Goros. Because the Apostle Paul says, we do not want anyone to blame us in this grace of God and this ministry. But in this way, foreseeing not only the good things before the Lord, but also before men. Not only is there the grace of God, but there is also the wisdom of God so that Paul and his fellow servants may manage the grace of God. The grace of God exists, but it needs to be managed well with the wisdom of God, with fear of God. For that reason, verse 22, we have sent with them our other brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, who now is much more diligent because of the great confidence that he has. He has confidence in you. He knows you and he trusts you. So that way the Apostle Paul sends for this ministry which is the grace of God with special wisdom of God and fear of God, foreseeing not all, the best not only before the Lord, but also before men. So he sends not only Titus, but also another two brethren, explaining that regarding Titus, he is my pa partner and my fe your fellow worker. He is an apostle with me, he is my co-worker, and he is your co-worker. Now regarding the other two brethren which I'm sending, they are apostles not of Christ, but of the churches, because the churches voted for them, and the churches sent them. They are apostles of the churches, and that's why they are the glory of Christ. No man, there, ma man goes on his own. He will either be sent by God with proof and confirmation that he is a messenger of Christ. Because if you go alone, if man goes alone, then he will have the results that only he can achieve, and that is nothing. Without Christ, you can do nothing. So either Christ will sail, send him with proof and confirmation that is spiritual, or the churches will send him so he will either be an apostle of Christ or he will be an apostle of the church. If he is an, uh, of the apostle of the church, then he is the glory of Christ. If he is an apostle of Christ, then he is a servant of Christ. The person who goes alone does not have a mission. He does not have a mission. He is sent alone, he returns alone. But the person who is sent with proof, spiritual proof, by Christ, then he has the results that Christ gives him. And the person who is sent by the churches, or by the church, he is the glory of Christ, and he has results that are spiritual of Christ. So, as an indication of your love and of our boasting, which we have in you, show them, and before the churches, the grace that is appointed for you. I repeat, an indication of the genu genuineness of your love will be proven by how you will receive Titus, who is a messenger of Christ, an apostle, and the two brethren who are messengers of the church, apostles, how you will accept them, how you will behave toward them, and how you will conclude your mission, the grace of God, that is given to you, not only to the churches of Macedonia, but to the churches of Corinth. Amen.